Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner, and I'm pleased to be joined again by the one and only Ram V. How are you, Hello. mate? Good. Uh, excited to talk about the book and, uh, yeah, enjoying my time making comics. And I'm excited to hear you talk about the book. And the book in question is uh, Dawn Runner, your new title uh, with artist Evan Cagle, which mm -hmm. is available for pre-order from the links attached to our conversation. So uh, how did this come about, Ram? Um, Dawn Runner, it, as a concept, is probably born from um, my love of the mecha kaiju genre. Um, I used to be the kid who went home every day and 6 p.m. put on the TV to watch the black and white, I don't know what rerun of Johnny Sacco and his giant robot Um I loved it. It was a, such a low budget show too, but so ahead of its time for for when it was actually made. But, but essentially, the giant robot was a guy in a cardboard costume. Um, but I loved the I loved the uh, the story. I loved the the concept. And then later, as a teenager, I found anime, and and I loved Randizer and and um, Robotech and uh, uh, Evangelion and, and that whole genre, if you will. Uh, but the more immediate trigger was uh, I ended up watching Pacific Rim and uh, Arrival, the Denny Villeneuve movie, um, pretty much within a couple of weeks of each other. Um, and again, just watching both those things made my brain do a thing where I went, Oh, no one's done, uh, or I felt like no one had done at least a contemporary take on Mecha Kaijus where the focus of this narrative was the hard sci-fi drama rather than sort of big monsters fighting armored robots. Um, and that led me down the path of this like, oh, what if it was a Mecha Kaiju thing, but it was a story about the armors that we put on as people because of what we can and cannot accomplish in our lives. You know, the the, the armor we put on to protect uh, all of humanity, but we can't even protect the ones that are closest to us, you know? Um, yeah. So that kind of uh, narrative focus, uh, which brought in elements of a ghost story eventually, you know, some romance and some, uh, if you've seen the film Frequency, where they talk to each other hundreds of years apart. Right on. On, yeah. On the radio. yeah, so some elements of that um are in the story as well so so that's how the concept came to me um and then the collaboration with evan actually came about very interestingly um evan had created an illustration called Golgotha, which had this giant mech and a, and a tiny human being standing in front of it in the middle of a storm or something like that uh, and i'd looked at it and i got this is the guy i should work with when i get around to making this comic and then a few months later, out of completely out of nowhere, Evan emails me and goes, I read Graffiti's Wall, which you did with Anand Radhakrishnan, and I thought it was such a wonderful comic. Um, I've loved comics for a very long time, and I'd love to, at some point, if you, if you think about creating something, I'd love to collaborate with you. And I just went like, man, what, what serendipity to, to have that happen. And then you know, I had a conversation with Evan a couple of times and we just hit it off. And and he's a huge uh, mech kaiju fan as well. He has an animation background, so he's seen all of the uh, animes that, that are in the in the genre. So it just felt like, yeah, the, the unseen forces of the universe were making this book happen. I love it. So, so many parallels in how you put that project together. I love the fact that you're using the, the skin of the vast spectacle of yeah. the of the kaiju genre, subverting that and telling a much more personal story. Yeah, within. yeah. I mean that 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 sounds like a real treat. Um, um, where does the story begin, Ren? So the r rather than get into where the, I'll tell you the premise yeah. and then the the one sort of narrative twist that that everything centers around. Uh, the premise is this: about a hundred years, the set in the future. And about a hundred years ago, uh, a portal had opened over Central America, over Guatemala, and these gigantic monsters just start stepping out of the portal and destroying everything in sight. 
Um, and humanity, you know, did what it usually does, sent it, scrambled the jets, threw everything they could at these creatures and realized that their skin is so impervious to any kind of energy that you could you could nuke these things and you'd have to cross your fingers in terms of like, did we actually get it? Um, and the only way, therefore, to defeat these creatures were to breach the skin. And therefore, there was a need for combat in a way that there hadn't been for centuries before. And so they started building these giant robots that would actually fight and wrestle these creatures. And they called them Iron Kings. Um, fast forward 100 years hence, there's a wall that has been built around most of Central America that keeps these uh, tetsos, that's what the creatures are called, sort of locked within. And as soon as one or two appear, the Iron Kings descend into this gladiatorial ring and and they they take out the tetsos, if you will. But because this is such a resource-consuming uh, uh, way of, of doing it, the world has reconfigured itself. All people do is they work for companies that make this piece that fits into this giant robot so it can be built. And so the only form of real entertainment or engagement has become you finish a hard day of work, you come back home, put on your TV, turn to turn to your local sports channel and watch uh, the mechs and kaijus go at it in, in gladiatorial combat. And so pilots have become these near godlike celebrities that are that are loved and celebrated. And our protagonist is one is the top pilot. Uh, her name is Anita Mar, and she used to pilot uh, a mech called Kyler. And so they're they're very famous. Uh, but at the beginning of our story, she has been put in charge of piloting a completely new prototype developed by this company called Cordonware. Uh, and the prototype is supposed to be secret technology that will turn the tide in humanity's favor. You know, we might win this war after all. Um, and so the prototype is called Dawn Run. The big narrative twist, and I'm spoiling the first issue a little bit for people, uh, is that these uh, mechs, they don't use operating systems to interpret human commands anymore. They are fitted directly with biocomputing, with the brains of previously dead soldiers. So it's a human pilot communicating with a human brain rather than a human communicating with a computer. And that changes everything uh, for how these mechs function, but it has some unforeseen consequences, which we will get into as, as the story goes on. Fast, absolutely fascinating, mate. I love it. What, what do you think that 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 really does sound intriguing? I, I, my feeling is that uh, that you're going to do really well with this book because I think you're playing around with the form that's very popular. It's really yeah. vogue at the moment, but you're doing something different with it. Um, what 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 do you think is the attraction within contemporary narrative of uh, beings of vast scale? Because whether it's kaijus or whether it's kind of, you know, Godzilla, Mothra, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there's definitely something about these beings of vast scale that is striking chord in popular entertainment. Where do you think that comes from? Well, the, the answer to me is, is obvious. Uh, I think the correct progression is Oppenheimer and then Godzilla. Uh, I think it very much comes from being confronted with the vastness of destruction. Uh, uh, and, and we have, as human beings, actually been confronted with that when, obviously, the, the nukes are dropped over Japan or when Vesuvius blows up and, and all of a sudden you have this giant creature spewing fire in front of you. Uh, so all of humanity is littered with this, with examples of giant disasters trampling upon humanity. And, and even that narrative form is, is, is a personal favorite of mine, uh, even when there aren't actual giant creatures involved. Just the idea that as human beings, we're such walking contradictions. Like We want to be the protagonist of our own stories. So everything centers around us. I made this choice. I did this thing. I, you know, I worked hard. I made all my money. I succeeded in my life. And then all of a sudden, you're confronted with this idea that 
Well, I'm a mountain that spews fire. I don't care what you did. I don't care how long you've been at my foothills. I don't care how many homes you built. I don't care who you love. I don't care who's your family. It's time for me to explode. All of you are going to die. Uh, and so I think narratively to be confronted with that sort of existential lack of empathy or meaning uh, from this thing that, that you are so familiar with, like you've lived at the base of this mountain for years, or you've, you've, you know, known Americans and fought in this war and you've made a valiant effort. And all of a sudden it's all over because this one bomb dropped on a city and just wiped everything out. Um, I think that's where the fascination with the vastness, certainly of antagonist, uh, comes from. Um, and I think the kaiju genre is fascinating because it does one thing that none of these other examples have. It lends intent to the to this vast thing that is destroying you. And because it does that, all of a sudden, you can now have a conversation with the thing that cares nothing about you. Uh, and I think that's where all the great stories come from. I, I think that's such an interesting point. I mean, for sure. The, the thing about the the uh, human condition is we're all at the, the very heart of our own narrative and uh, and our own narratives are played out within our heads in, in widescreen yeah. in, a, in, a, in a cinema devoted to our personal narrative. Yeah. But of course, those jarring moments in life now, whether it's nuclear testing, whether it's natural disasters, whether it is just yeah. the actions of the natural world. Those things that serve to yeah, remind just, us of it's our It's just own a giant foot coming down yeah, from off screen right on. and you're like, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. And and the other thing would be uh, large scale war. You know, it's like my yeah. my my grandfather's generation. You know, yeah, you you're suddenly confronted with something that's so much bigger than you. The loss yeah. of life is all around you. Yeah, the incidental nature of an individual human life is there in front of you all the time. And yeah. reconciling those two to place them at the heart of a comic book narrative, I think, is a really interesting thing. Yeah, and then to give that intent, like yeah. the war does not care about you but then when you write a narrative and you have the war looking down on you going like huh what is this creature who is this one person that could change because because all of these mecha kaiju stories also have that one thing in common it's always individual actions that save us it's always one person who refuses to believe that the creature is evil or one person who refuses to give up and go home and still thinks there's a chance and so it is uh, that sort of narrative of eternal hope and affirmation that, no, everything you do matters. Everything, every choice you make does matter, even in the face of this giant thing that cares nothing for your life. So I feel like it is actually every Mecha Kaiju story is an eternally hopeful, if not a little bit egocentric uh, story. So so well said, mate. So interesting. I can't wait to read the book, which I believe is is out in April. March. Am I right, mate? March, March. March yeah. yeah, out in March, and definitely up and available for pre order from ForbiddenPlanet.com, and the links right here. Um, as always, Ram, such a pleasure chatting with you, mate. Yeah, great pleasure chatting with you too. I have to say before we before we sign off, I should say, I mean, we've talked so much about story, but. I would say at least half of the attraction, and I'm being kind to myself when I say that, of this book is Evan's art. Uh, I think people are going to discover that Evan is an absolute master that they've all been sleeping on when they read this book. Um, I, you mentioned, you know, taking a popular genre. It also does another thing with Evan's art, certainly, that I'm I'm very excited about, is it marries two things that are quite popular, but so far have been distinct in their own areas. It marries European sci-fi art, so very Mobius, Trouillé, that kind of art. Yeah. And it marries that with Japanese manga storytelling. Um, so very much Urasawa, very much Evangelion. Um, and so when people read this, I, I, I've already had a bunch of retailers talk to me about it and say, we're excited to put this on our manga shelf because it feels like it would belong there. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see how that plays out as well. I mean, this is right up our Forbidden Planet Street. I mean, we, yeah. uh, as you know, we publish manga, we publish yep. Druye, yeah. and uh, and we we've got, I think, the biggest manga section in Europe in yeah. Forbidden Planet yeah. London. Yeah, yeah. And, so I'm very uh, excited to see 
how that sort of jump across the aisles happens between because wouldn't you agree with me that like american comics and manga both popular both have always been very distinct yes, in their I, in their oh, readership agree more mate yeah i couldn't agree more uh, and and i think people are yet to find that middle ground crossover book which yeah. the, and if this is that that would be amazing you know because there yeah i mean fingers crossed i hope so but yeah and, we'll and see <laughs> I, I well i think the way into doing that is to do what you've done which is to create something that's of its own that's yeah. jumped out of your brain out of evan's brain with his yeah. beautiful wonderful artwork you know i don't think you can really nail although they've tried nail spider-man into a manga format or yeah, nail yeah Batman into no. it. it you know the, the u.s roots are encoded in who they are right yes and, and i feel like manga is so much more than just the art style right like all of those things like i've seen the i've seen the spider-man manga stuff i've seen the batman manga stuff um it always takes the art but it doesn't take the storytelling vibe and and yeah. that's what you need um the batman ninja animation comes very close uh if you haven't seen it but i have yeah i love it yeah yeah, it's the it's the it's the narrative beats that are more important uh, to my to my mind. Yeah, the the soul of it, if you will, I think yeah. is 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 what's important, uh, and the fact that you're playing around in that wheelhouse and, and trying to achieve that, I think, is a you know really laudable endeavor and very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just something that seems logical because, again, going back to the Pacific Rim and the arrival of it all, to my mind. I put Pacific Rim as something very influenced by Japanese mecha kaiju genre storytelling. And I put Arrival as something very influenced by European sci-fi kind of storytelling. So it was it was built into the to the way the idea formed in my head. Absolutely brilliant, mate. I, I, I can't wait. Um published by Dark Horse, coming in March and uh, available for pre-order here. And uh, yeah, great chatting with you, brother. Be Same here. Thank really you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. You take care. I'll see you soon. Yeah. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.